There are two main reasons a soldier in the 18th century would be willing to go overseas and fight in a foreign land. They are ideologically motivated to support a cause they believe in, or they are soldiers of fortune fighting for personal gain. While there were certainly many European officers who fought for the Continental Army during the American Revolution driven by ideology, such as Tadeusz Kajusko, Casimir Pulaski, and the Marquis de Lafayette, many others were soldiers of fortune, fighting to increase both their prestige and personal wealth. One of these men was a well-trained Prussian officer who would turn the men of the Continental Army from a ragtag assembly of militiamen into a highly disciplined military machine. His name was Freier Friedrich Wilhelm August Heinrich Ferdinand von Steuben, but you probably know him simply as Baron von Steuben. Today, we'll delve into one man's journey from being the aide-de-camp to Frederick the Great of Prussia to the Inspector General of the Continental Army of the nascent United States of America. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Baron von Steuben was born Friedrich Wilhelm Ludolf Gerhard Augustine Louis von Steuben on September 17, 1730, in the Prussian fortress of Magdeburg, to a captain of the Royal Prussian Engineers, Wilhelm Augustine von Steuben, and his wife, Mary Dorothea von Jagau. There was never any question that Frederick would be a soldier. Despite being just a captain, his father was close with the Prussian king, Frederick I. The Baron never wrote much about his childhood, so we're left piecing together fragmentary evidence about his childhood and early teenage years, despite his family being a part of the German Junker class and his father's ties to Frederick, the family wasn't wealthy. In reality, most members of the Junker class were only marginally wealthier than peasants. In 1733, three-year-old Frederick accompanied his father to Russia where the elder von Steuben would serve in the Russo-Turkish War of 1735 to 1739, before returning home in 1740. Upon the duo's return, Friedrich was briefly educated by Jesuits at the garrisons of Nese and Breslau. When Prussia entered the War of Austrian Succession for the second time in 1744, 14-year-old Friedrich volunteered alongside his father. By the time he was 17, Frederick formally joined the Prussian army as a cadet. By 1753, he was a second lieutenant. By the start of the Seven Years' War in 1756, he was a first lieutenant. He saw action at several battles, including the battles of Prague, Rosbach, Kay, and Kundersdorf, experiencing crushing defeat and ringing victory. From 1759 to 1761, he was assigned as aide-de-camp to Major General von Noblach under Prince Henry of Prussia, Frederick the Great's brother. The two formed a close friendship that would greatly help von Steuben's later military career. Throughout his service in the Seven Years' War, the young Baron was wounded twice before eventually being captured alongside Noblach at the Siege of Treptow in October 1761. After Russia and Prussia made peace in April 1762, von Steuben, most likely due to his friendship with Prince Henry, was promoted to captain and assigned as the aide-de-camp to Frederick himself. While he would only serve his king for a little more than a year, during that time, he was one of 13 officers trained personally by Frederick. For unknown reasons, von Steuben resigned from the Prussian military in 1763. While it is possible he left the army because further promotion was unlikely, he later wrote that he resigned due to an inconsiderate step and an implacable personal enemy. Many historians argue that this personal enemy might have been Frederick. By 1764, however, the well-educated Friedrich found employment as the Hof Marshal in the tiny principality of Hohenzollern-Hechingen. 
as the Hof Marshal to Prince Josef, von Steuben oversaw all economic affairs in the Principality, ran the Prince's household, and acted as his senior advisor. During the thirteen years he served the Prince, the Baron often accompanied him on trips to France. While lounging in Germain, Steuben was introduced to the future French Minister of War, Claude Louis, Comte de Saint-Germain. The two developed a relationship of the most intimate and friendly in character. While still serving the prince in 1777, his friend, the Comte de Saint-Germain, introduced him to Benjamin Franklin and Silas Dean, the American representatives in Paris. After leaving the first meeting with the men in disgust, he was told he would need to go to Congress as a volunteer first and offer his services, he returned to Paris after he failed to obtain a commission in the Dutch military and then began negotiating directly with Benjamin Franklin over his terms of service. On September 26, 1777, the Baron set sail for America aboard the French warship Flamande with a letter of introduction erroneously claiming he was a lieutenant general in the Prussian military. But why did the Baron suddenly leave his life of leisure and luxury? Let's take a quick aside here to discuss perhaps the most central part of the Baron's legacy, at least today, his sexuality. For the standards of his time, he was openly gay, or as the History Channel has proclaimed him, the Revolutionary War hero who was openly gay. While this characterization is accurate, he was romantically attracted to men, there are some problems with it. Calling him gay applies our own conception of sexuality and gender to a very different time and place. We also need to remember that being publicly outed as a homosexual was a serious crime in both Europe and the United States at the time. The reality, however, is far more complex. For example, Prince Henry and Frederick the Great, von Steuben's early patrons, were both known across Europe to be gay. It's possible Frederick chose the young, battle-hardened von Steuben to be his aide-de-camp because he was infatuated with him. Perhaps even Prince Henry, who frequented spas alongside von Steuben that were known to attract those seeking relations with other men, had been romantically involved with him in the past and recommended him to his brother for this very reason. And the Baron hardly decided to go to America for altruistic reasons, despite the fact Benjamin Franklin wrote to Washington that he was leaving behind wealth and power out of an idealistic commitment to liberty. The reality is that he was about to be arrested by the French clergy for sodomy. The American delegation was well aware of the charges against him. As Silas Dean wrote to Prince Joseph shortly before von Steuben absconded to the New World, it has come to me from different sources that Mr. de Steuben is accused of having taken familiarities with young boys, which the laws forbid and punish severely. I have even been informed that this is the reason why de Steuben was obliged to leave Hechingen and that the clergy of your country intended to prosecute him by law as soon as he may establish himself anywhere. In the end, Franklin and Dean decided that Steuben, an experienced officer trained personally by Frederick the Great, was far too valuable to lose to rumors. Once in the United States, the Baron would have extraordinarily intense emotional relationships with both Benjamin Walker and William North, young officers in the Continental Army who served as his aides. The unmarried von Steuben later made the two men his heirs, which, at the time, was common practice for homosexual lovers since they could not legally marry. One evening at Valley Forge, the Baron held a party for junior officers. The only criteria for admittance? None should be admitted that had on a whole pair of breeches. We can only speculate whether this was a tone-deaf joke poking fun at the very real supply issues facing the Continental Army, or whether it was meant quite literally. George Washington, as well as his soldiers, were well aware of the Baron's history and his behaviors at Valley Forge. Still, 
Much like Franklin and Dean, Washington ultimately decided that von Steuben was far too valuable to lose. They needed him, whether he was gay or not. While Washington might have turned a blind eye to von Steuben, he didn't to other acts of sodomy. Shortly after the Baron arrived at Valley Forge on March 10, 1788, a court-martial found a Lieutenant Enslin guilty of sodomy and perjury, being breaches of 5th Article 18th Section of the Articles of War, and do sentence him to be dismissed the service with infamy. His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief, approves the sentence and with abhorrence and detestation of such infamous crimes, orders Lieutenant Enslin to be drummed out of camp tomorrow morning. Nonetheless, after the war, the Baron asked Washington to write a letter to Congress to vouch for his morals so he would receive a pension, and Washington happily obliged. The Baron's story offers a fascinating insight into the complex reality of how a gay man could live with tacit acceptance in a world where his sexuality, his love for other men, was a crime. For our purposes, this brief discussion of sexuality will suffice, but to better understand the complexities of this topic, we encourage you to conduct your own research. Let us now continue our story where we left off. Baron von Steuben and his little entourage arrived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire on December 1st, 1777. The party was almost arrested upon arrival because they were all wearing scarlet red uniforms. By February 5th, 1778, the Baron had arrived at York, where he introduced himself to the Continental Congress. Congress, for once, found themselves a military man from Europe who lacked neither experience nor training, and he was quickly sent to Valley Forge, where he presented himself personally to Washington on February 23, 1778, amid a fierce blizzard. Washington was impressed by the man, writing that the Baron appears to be much of a gentleman, and, as far as I have had the opportunity of judging, a man of military knowledge and acquainted with the world. If Washington was impressed, his men were entranced. Writing years later, a soldier would recount that the Baron seemed to me a perfect personification of Mars, the Roman god of war, the trappings of his horse, the enormous holsters of his pistols, his large size, and his strikingly martial aspect all seemed to favor the idea. Washington quickly appointed him as temporary inspector general, effective March 1st. Steuben was horrified by what he saw at Valley Forge. Men relieved themselves wherever they wished. Dead animals were strewn about the camp where they fell. The camp had no organization. Von Steuben set out to change all this. He immediately ordered the base to be rebuilt in an ordered fashion, with tents and huts laid out in neat rows according to rank and unit. He forbade soldiers from relieving themselves wherever they wished and constructed latrines on the opposite side of the camp from the kitchen. The Baron also went about formalizing the logistical and bureaucratic structure of the army, enforcing the strict keeping of records to remove both the administrative incompetence and war profiteering that was all too common in the Continental Army. The Baron's success in quickly creating a unified drill set for the Continental Army was just as important as the logistical and bureaucratic reforms he implemented. Before his reforms, each regimental commander had their own drill sets and maneuvers, meaning that units had difficulty coordinating in battle. The men were also more likely to use their bayonets as tools or skewers rather than as a weapon. The Baron went to work. He assembled a company of around 120 hand-picked men, the best of the Continental Army, and drilled them rigorously twice a day. He taught them how to march properly in the condensed column. He taught them battlefield formations and maneuvers. He showed them how to reload and fire their weapons quicker and with the benefit of the bayonet. He showed them how to maintain both themselves and their weapons for peak efficiency. 
After training with the Baron, his disciples would train the men of their units, effectively turning the Continental Army into a cohesive fighting force that followed a uniform doctrine, not only increasing their combat effectiveness, but their ability for inter-unit cooperation. Despite being a rigorous, no-nonsense officer, the Baron was beloved by the men. Despite his well-dressed appearance, he was loud and vulgar. He'd yell at the men in French, German, and English when they would make a mistake. The only English he knew was Squad, Halt, and Goddamn! The Baron also developed a deep appreciation for his men. He especially admired their tenacity in the face of adversity, as well as their intellect. Recounting his experience training the men, he wrote to a friend in Prussia, The genius of this nation is not in the least to be compared with that of the Prussians, Austrians, or French. In Europe, you say to your soldier, do this, and he doeth it. But I am obliged to say to the American soldier, this is the reason why you ought to do that, and then he does it. If the men were impressed with the exotic, flamboyant, and vulgar baron, then Washington, witnessing the transformation of his army, was even more so. On May 5th, Major General von Steuben was officially made the Inspector General of the Continental Army by order of the Continental Congress. The fruits of the Baron's hard work quickly became evident when the Continental Army again engaged the British. At the battles of Barron and Monmouth in 1778, the army marched and fought like true professionals exceeding all expectations, standing their ground against the British, inflicting severe casualties at Monmouth and withdrawing quickly in good order at Barron. While the Baron would continue to serve in the Continental Army, his activities at Valley Forge, shaping an army of ragtag peasants into a professional army that could go muzzle to muzzle with the British in an open field, was his greatest achievement. Spending the winter of 1778 to 1779 in Philadelphia, Baron von Steuben produced a book outlining his maneuvers, drills, and regulations. The book, Regulations for the Order and Discipline of the Troops of the United States, would remain the official U.S. military manual until after the War of 1812. After being one of the officers presiding over the trial of Major John Andre, and with the war in the North dying down, Major General von Steuben was sent to the South alongside Major General Nathaniel Green, the new commander of the Southern Department. For a brief time, he would serve as an instructor to Green's men. After training Green's men from 1780 to 1781, the Baron managed all military operations in Virginia. Most importantly, he ensured the supplies Green's army desperately needed got through. After taking the better part of a year off due to illness, the Baron accompanied Washington to Yorktown, where he commanded one of the three divisions under Washington. After the war, he remained in service longer than most other officers, helping Washington demobilize the army and preparing contingency plans for the nation's future defense. Just hours before Washington officially resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief of the Army on December 23, 1783, he wrote a letter to the Baron, which read in part, My dear Baron, although I have taken frequent opportunities, both in public and private, of acknowledging your great zeal, attention, and abilities in performing the duties of your office, Yet I wish to make use of this last moment of my public life to signify in the strongest terms my entire approbation of your conduct and to express my sense of the obligations the public is under to you for your faithful and meritorious services. This is the last letter I shall ever write while I continue in the service of my country. The hour of my resignation is fixed at twelve this day after which I shall become a private citizen on the banks of the Potomac, where I shall be glad to embrace you and to testify the great esteem and consideration with which you carried out your duties. 
Baron von Steuben, a true hero of the American Revolution, was unsure what to do when he left the Continental Army on March 24, 1784. Due to his service, he was given U.S. citizenship by the Pennsylvania General Assembly in March 1784 and the New York State Legislature in July 1786. Congress never repaid him for his services during the war. He only received less than 5% of the money he anticipated for his services. Nonetheless, his paramour, Benjamin Walker, and friend, Alexander Hamilton, helped him acquire the title to the Jan Zabriskie House, an estate seized from a loyalist on April 1st, 1785. With the help of Alexander Hamilton, between 1783 and 1785, Baron von Steuben withdrew $26,000 from the Bank of New York to fund his flamboyant lifestyle. Nonetheless, his extravagant spending and poor management of the funds meant that by 1787, he faced bankruptcy. He was only saved by Walker, who assumed control of his finances. After briefly living with Walker, who was married by this time, he was granted a large tract of land, 16,000 acres by Congress, in 1790. He was also given an annual pension of $2,400. By the time he died, on November 28, 1794, at the age of 64, he had convinced North and Walker to settle on the land beside him. When we remember Major General Baron von Steuben, we need to acknowledge the full scope of his life and legacy, not just his modern-day designation as gay. While his story provides meaningful insight into the experience of being a gay man in the 18th century, it's important to remember that he, like Prince Henry and Frederick the Great, had the privilege of rank and status to protect them. This privilege was not afforded to Lieutenant Enslin and countless other men who were not as fortunate. In the end, though, his sexuality was a major part of who he was, but it alone did not define him. He was a gifted officer, a leader of men, and a logistician who played an integral part in guaranteeing American independence. To this end, he was a founding member of the Society of the Cincinnati. He was also heavily involved in the German-American community, becoming an elder in the German Reformed Church, and served as president of the German Society of New York from 1785 until his death. While we can't say for sure that his reforms saved Washington's army, his reforms did significantly improve the combat effectiveness cohesion, and organization of the Continental Army. Major General von Steuben brought order where there was none. While the men of the Continental Army may have arrived at Valley Forge as raw, undisciplined, and demoralized recruits, they left as hardened, well-trained, disciplined, and reinvigorated soldiers of the new United States of America. The legacy of his military service was far-reaching even after his passing. His military manual remained the official doctrine of the U.S. military throughout the War of 1812. Its influence has even been felt in the modern era. It has served as a source of inspiration and guidance for generations of military guides and manuals that have followed. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, an early supporter of the American Revolution and a confidant to many of those we consider founding fathers, the author Mercy Otis Warren.